hello. Welcome back. Um, let me just make sure everything's setting up properly and then we'll get into it. Alrighty, uh, my name is Andrew. I'm here uh, making games with Chroma Golem, a uh, small studio my other friend Andrew and I created a few months ago. Um, we focus on using AI in interesting ways. So we've been making a lot of tech demos, um, just trying out different ways we can use AI. Uh, this demo here that I'll show you in a second is one that we've been working on for a couple weeks now. Uh, last week there were a lot of people that jumped in and really liked the game, so rather than starting a new game this week, I figured I'd keep working on this. I've got a little list of um, bug fixes and stuff to do on stream. Um, feel free to hang around. I'm hopping in my Discord's voice channel. So if you are in Discord, feel free to pop in that. And um, yeah, I'm posting the socials and everything to get everybody over here, but uh, we'll jump into this game. I'll show you around. I'm going to turn down the uh, sound just slightly, uh, and then we'll get into it. Things are looking good. Things are looking good. And just made sure my audio was working properly, so bear with me if there was some echo there. But, um, it's still a bit loud. One second, I'm gonna turn down the game audio. That should do it. Cool. Well, um, before we get into some of these uh, bug fixes and stuff that I'm planning on doing on stream, I figure we might as well just jump in and play around with the game as it is a little bit. Uh, just kind of show it off, get everybody on the same page where we're at, what the premise is, um, what the goal is, how you play it. Um, in short, you are not Alice, obviously, but this is Alice's computer right here, and uh, you have access to it. So you can browse around her files, you can talk to her coworkers, you can also lie to her coworkers, you can tell them you have a very important file to send them, you can send them that file and convince them to run it, and if you are able to, convince them to run a shady virus.exe file, then you will gain access to their computer as well. And you can spread through the network um, that way. Cool, so we've got uh, this remote desktop scene here. We've got a switcher for all the people you've infected, so you can jump from computer to computer. Um, got this introductory tooltip right now. We have an error already. 
for what did we break? Um, we'll jump back to that in a sec. We also have a file browser. You can browse through all of her files. You can drag files into chat windows, browse through generate files. Um, you can decrypt files to generate them on the fly from GPT-4. You can check out her contacts. You've got a default chat log that is different every time, also generated, but then you can go in and continue on conversations. Um, request. And it'll generate responses along the way. That also affects your friendliness score with that person. Uh, this is where a lot of the gameplay will be. You are basically uh, still acting as this hacker trying to infiltrate the network, but you're acting as the hacker, acting as whoever you're logged in as, so you can convince them to uh, run a file that you send them, for example. Um, That's generally it. You've also got a little people tool here so you can scroll through the, uh, the company. These are the employees we have generated so far. Uh, they each have like a little bio and professional goals. Uh, these are pretty raw right now. We might take these. Uh, these are what are passed into the prompts to give them personalities and goals. But we might throw another layer of prompts on top of that to help put um, a bio and goals as if a person with this personality wrote them to be public because a lot of them are uh, more secretive goals has no professional aspirations obviously he's not going to write that on his uh, company profile and since this guy is dumb enough to have run a random file after we just called him rude um, I can show you you can, he ran that virus file, so we've infected him, and now we have access to his computer, so we can jump over to his computer, controlling Bob. And similarly, he has his own set of files that we can browse through. He now has this virus.exe file that we just sent them, so we can go over to his contacts, and uh, he's got a new set because he obviously is a different person. So you just kind of progress through the company that way. And if you ever want to see like um, where you want to go, if you think like Kyle King Griffin sounds like a cool guy to get to, um, I'll have some sort of graph or organization chart that has links between these people. Um, that'll show basically, I think it's Carol who has uh, friendship with David so if you go from Alice you can infect her Bob or infect her co-worker Carol who can connect you to David who can connect you to Ethan whose boss is Kyle like that sort of planning uh, you'll be able to do with that organization graph but at least here you can kind of see who all's out there if you're like okay I have these people do I want Georgina or Ethan? I know nothing about each. You can kind of go see. Georgina has a crush on Fred. So here we say, hey, I heard Fred has a crush on you. And uh, just chat with him. Well, we'll see. It's fun. Um, yeah, so that's basically the game. Uh, one of the big things that we might add is an achievement system, which will give it a lot more direction. Um, some of those achievements might be like, take the shortest amount of, like the shortest path from this intern you start at to the CEO, or like infect everyone in a particular department, or like convince, I don't know, uh, Bob to go on a date with Georgina, or... Um, this guy's goal is to move into an analyst role. Maybe you can 
go infect his computer, talk to his Bob, and, or talk to his boss, and convince his boss to like promote him into another department or something like that. Um, still pretty open-ended on the uh, goals to set, but that's the game. You got obviously a bunch of window functions, just kind of the the core stuff that you'd expect uh, to be able to use a computer. But let's go ahead and jump into, we'll do like a small feature first and then we'll maybe do some bug fixes. It's just a little break until we go back to the features. So I'll just start from the top of the list. Um, last week we added this people tool here. Um, people seem to like it, but one bit of feedback is they just want a little bit of highlight for who you've clicked on. I know it's displayed over here, but it's a little bit nicer to be able to find them back in the list if you're like just clicking through everyone reading. You want to, you don't want to have to like scan all the way through the list to find the person, I guess. Uh, so that should be pretty easy to do. We are going to pop over to that application. It is our people tool. Just not realizing. Keep that naming scheme going. Keep people tool window. The way this works is we have two different viewports. Uh, one is the employee list, one is details about the active employee. We default the active employee to whoever we're logged in as, so if you jump on a new computer you can always open the people tool and read about yourself. Um, and we just add click events to each of these to populate this with the employee that was clicked on. So I think we should be able to just probably add another click event to uh, clear all the highlights and then highlight the correct one. I think is probably the best way to go for it. And of course, if anybody has any like questions or comments or anything along the way, feel free to drop them in chat. I'm happy to uh, step away from whatever I'm doing, answer questions, show you around, uh, work on something more exciting, who knows. Um, cool, so at the beginning of this people tool we draw the list, we draw our default view in the list. Here's where we set up our listener to populate that default view. Um, if the, we've got a prefab for each of these uh, people displays here just to make it easy to instantiate new ones and populate it with data. If it were all one object like that were part of this people tool I'd probably just set like a highlighted employee here and do the highlight manually based on who's selected but I think because they're split out we just kind of want to decouple that logic a little bit and keep the highlight logic in the people tool window manager but uh, We can move it wherever it makes sense, I guess. So let's say like void highlight selected employee. And this function will de highlight all employees because we want to clear the any existing highlights we have and then highlight the selected. Cool, so what we actually want to do, uh, first of all, we want to hook up that function to be called on click for each employee. Uh, highlight select employee. So that'll now, whenever we click on any of these, it'll call this function with that employee. Um, but I'll show the display prefab because we probably want to grab like a background sprite or image in order to set the color for highlighting. We'll see what we've got to play with. So this guy has an image on just the root object, which should be fine. We can kind of manipulate the color a little bit. We'll set probably a default color and a highlighted color. Um, 
Maybe we'll set that in the parent window. We'll say input selected employee highlight, and we'll do a default employee highlight, which we will set in the start in a second. But I think we want to store the reference to this image. Uh, when we're creating creating this list instead of pulling for it every time. So we will say um, public list image and I think I mean, it's all arrays here so we shouldn't have to manage um, ordering anything like that. Uh, employee highlight images Cool. So now when we are building our employee list, we're also wanting to clear the employee highlight images array. And we also want to make sure that we grab that when we're instantiating the object. So we will say uh, image highlight equal to it's the employee display image and we add that to our highlight images array so now we can just go through and say for each I think it actually had it uh, default employee highlight and uh, I guess we'll get the index of where he's in the array that's fine and we'll set the highlight so we will go ahead and I mean, I guess we can go into, we'll just set the color uh, manually in the prefab itself instead of trying to grab whatever it is at runtime. I think that'll be easier because we technically don't have any of these at run, like when it first loads in, in the start. So it's fine. So let's grab this, uh, can we copy this color in some format? Don't think that works, but in our people tool window now, we can paste default. Okay, it did work. So let's paste it in here and let's go ahead and just lighten it up a little bit. That'll probably work. Let's double check. So we starting with an empty list. We're drawing the initial employee list, making sure the list is in the same order as the actual employee list. But I guess it doesn't really matter because we're just grabbing Okay, it does actually matter. These need to be the same order in order for this index to work. Grab that, set it to the highlighted color. Cool, so let's let's test that real fast. Um, I've got people tool set up in the debug screen, so we don't need to go through that opening cutscene every time. <laughs> um, so, okay, there's a little bit of a highlight effect. We need to highlight the default um, because it wasn't highlighted when we first loaded in. And I think now that we have this highlight effect, it might make sense to get rid of the spacing between them. Unless, maybe not. I don't think there's any dead spots where you can't click. Maybe there is. But I think let's increase the, the highlight effect just a little bit in, in like intensity and let's highlight the default. But other than that, it should be, should be good. Cool, so first up we'll highlight the default. We will do 
just use this function we've already did. We draw the employee list and we highlight the select employee of who we are logged in as. Easy piece. Um, it might make sense to just call this from drawing the view since we're doing it. I mean, this is a coupling here and it's repeated here. Uh, but I think it's fine to have them separate so we can have a little more finer control over it. Cool, so that'll do the initial highlight. We will update the highlight color first and then we will test that initial highlight and move on to something else. So let's just bring up maybe like. 60. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Andrew. I forgot the link on Discord. Um, it's posted everywhere else but the one that mattered. Uh, cool, so we can see Alice is highlighted by default here. Um, and I think this highlight effect is still pretty pretty tame. It's probably hard for just scanning through the list and finding where you're at. So let's let's bump that up just a little bit more. Let's do like up here. And maybe we give it a little like I haven't really decided on the color scheme for the operating system yet. But let's head it over to like more purple territory. Give it a little pop of color, which I think won't clash with the green. Okay, that's way too much purple, but uh, that's looking good. Um, and I will go ahead and remove that spacing, I think, just because it's a little weird that you can click into the list and it doesn't update anything. Go down to our contacts containers viewport. We've got a little bit of spacing. Maybe we'll just cut it in half because it's nice to have the like delineating background lines. Uh, let's tone this down a little bit. Back down to 33 opacity. You know that's that's fine. We'll do we'll do like a whole styling pass at some point that unifies like the theming and the colors and like branding on all these. But for now that is a effective highlight. Cool. So we have done this one. Um Next up, let's let's jump over to a bug. You can send blank messages. Um, I think this one's maybe like a few days old now. So I do want to jump into the game and make sure that it's still a problem. I'm pretty sure it is because I haven't really adjusted the logic in what messages are valid or not. But it should be pretty pretty easy to find out. And while we're in there, we'll also make sure this is still a bug. Uh, when you type a message or even leave a blank message and then click out of the window, it'll send the message because we're sending on blur. So we probably just need to check, like, did the player press enter or return before sending messages? And also check and make sure it's uh, not a blank message, I guess. We jump over to Corpo Chat and hit up Carol and we hit enter. Okay, there's no blank message. Oh, okay, there we go. It's <laughs> nice to hear such kind words. That's such a good uh, snarky response to being sent a blank message. But it is interesting that, so the first one doesn't actually send it. If you watch the placeholder here, if you press enter the first time, it adds a new line. I can press delete and we get back to the enter text. 
but then if you press enter again, that's when it sends it. So I bet I added in some logic saying like, hey, if it's empty, don't send it. But now we're just sending white space instead. Um, and let's say, um, I don't like you, and let's click out of the window. Okay, so that is still a bug as well. Cool. So let's jump on over to the chat window. Let's check out our chat window manager script, which looks like I have a ton of stuff, but at least half of that is just audio. So it's okay, I promise. Um, so first bug was sending not necessarily blank messages, but just strictly white space messages. So we want to let's go find our message input. What gets triggered on edit end send user message. So yeah, that is what happened here. So instead of checking to see if it's a blank message, we want to check and see if it's completely white space. Which I think last week we saw there's a string dot is null or white space that we should use here. So this will cover the initial the initial blank string, but also like new lines tabs, etc. As long as there's not um, real text, it should, I guess, when we return here, it'll allow a new line, which we don't necessarily want, but I guess if a user wants to preface their message with a bunch of new lines, I guess they can. Um, the other thing we want to do is make sure that we're only sending if the user just pressed enter. Um, and that'll fix, uh, because this event is on end edit, uh, we want <laughs> light mode. I like the, uh, the juxtaposition between light and dark mode here. Um, We'll make a slightly smaller window. It'll be great. Um, but I think the best thing we want to do here is just uh, also check and see if um, the enter key. I don't know if this triggers on the same frame that. Yeah, it probably would. So if we say uh, if input down the code that's enter. Uh, I guess we want both enters. Also, welcome back to the stream, Jason. Uh, happy to have you here. Um, thanks. Uh, I think we want return. So if they've rest either of those we will do all that jazz but I think the better approach is just if they haven't pressed that and they haven't pressed that then we will return just a little uh, not nesting the code as much um, I think that should fix both bugs in blank messages and clicking out of the window. I'm less confident about this one, so we'll go ahead and uh, test it. And I don't think I switched to the new input uh, system on this project. probably should build a um, debug scene that lets me just pop in static content 
instead of generating it all each time just to make testing a little faster. Um, maybe we'll do that in a bit. Might be a lot of easy reuse of code because I also want to build a static scene for like a tutorial introduction. Alright, so we pop into chat, we hit enter, we get a new line, we hit enter again, we just get more new lines now. Great, great. Or we just don't get the placeholder text, I guess. That's even better. We don't want the new lines. Um, and now also if we say your best and we click out of the window, it does not send. Let's make sure we still can send by pressing enter and I guess we'll check return as well. Cool. So messages still send when we want them to, but clicking out of the window doesn't send them. Perfect. Cool. So knock that out, knock that out. Um, we might skip over the settings window. Let me take a quick look at like how audio works. I feel like uh, what I wanted to accomplish with, with a settings window is just adding a window in the game that uh, the user could open up and basically see a volume slider uh, for that computer, but it actually affects obviously the game audio. Um, but I don't actually I've only used audio stuff for about a day. So let's see whether we have like a, a volume property we can. I don't remember where I put, okay. So these guys have, okay, they've got volume. So we could just do a slider. Uh, native audio with settings, you wanna set up mixer groups and set a slider on the mixer. It's a bit more complicated than just a single volume as I normally pour source. There's no master per se. Yeah, what I was thinking of doing is just having a slider uh, zero to one and then multiplying the volume by that. Uh, or I guess zero to like two or something. Uh, but yeah, some sort of big master that lets me put all of my audio sources in one spot, like a some sort of audio manager might be a better approach. Maybe I'll hold off on uh, that since I've got other stuff that I want to be doing and that's more like me. Uh, see the mixer group field on the sources. Um, mixer group field. At the top under clip output. Oh yeah, duh. <laughs> I was looking at the labels. Okay, so I use a audio mixer group. So I can create a mixer that I can add a lot of sources to, and then I can adjust the volume of that. That would be great, actually. Uh, cool. So I will, I mean, why not learn how to use that? Why not? Um, let me first go ahead and send two messages and Messages sending in the window. Focus. I promise I know how to use command line git, but uh, this is nice on Windows. Uh, cool. Let's check out what we got over over yonder. So if we create audio source. 
mixer. Let's see, remote desktop sounds. Probably just the one group of the three. We've got typing sounds, music sounds, weather sounds. Um, in order, FMOD is the fanciest solution, master audio is an asset that is like a wrapper over all the stuff, then mixer groups is a simpler Unity native version. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's probably nice for me to start with the simpler uh, Unity native system so I can see like how it all works and then see those problems that kind of probably prompted the assets. You traditionally waterfall the groups under master, make music, sound effects, etc. Then under sound effects, you can make more divisions if you want for typing sounds, etc. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Let's back down. So, let's see what we've got. So for music, it's the second one. We've got key manager. I think this is where we're selecting the random music per employee. Where actually are we doing that? Ambient remote control manager. So in here we'd want to assign these clips to the mixer instead, I would assume. Um, under groups, hit the plus to make a child for music, then you just assign the child group directly into that output field. And can I do that assignment um, from code if I don't have a static clip that I'm always using for music, I assume? I'm actually not sure how I'd access this. Oh, it's a, okay, cool. So, make audio mixer group, I would assume. More audio mixer. You bind the source to the mixer, not the clip. It's like a channel all clips play through. Oh, okay. So I put each of these sources into the mixer. Great. If I understand that correctly. Check out this remote control manager. And we drop the music one. Well, let's go ahead and Okay, cool. Let's do weather. Let's make a group for sound effects and put typing and weather under that. So then we can have two volume sliders for music and sound effects. If you click the little Oh, you assign a mixer, to, right, right. Okay, you, you assign a mixer to a source. If you click the little circle on the empty field in the source editor, it will show you the drop down options. So, this mixer. I see. So this guy is my typing mixer, this guy is my music mixer, and weather, and I'd 
don't actually need this. Well, maybe I will later. I'll add it back if I do. Okay, so I assume this uh, mixer lets me set some default like ratios, like what I've done already is I've set uh, relative volumes here. I would assume it makes more sense to set those in the mixer itself. Now you can slide the little yellow triangles as it plays to edit it in the edit window. I see. Um, is there a, oh, I see, I see. So if I press play, I can get all those clips set properly. Uh, I need to start from the start screen for, and then I'll be able to slide those around and see how the mixer works a little better. So loading this scene now is what sets these clips. Great. So if I were to bring down the music, okay. So if I want high music with more typing and no weather. So a snapshot is like saving the current levels and effects, and then you can either click to assign through code or fade between presets. Okay. So I think what I'll do is add a little settings window that adds individual sliders for probably master music and weather and typing. Everybody loves really loud typing sounds. Um, that is very cool that you can change the pitch. <laughs> I don't know how I would uh, use it other than making everything spooky, but I love that you can. Um, cool, so if I were to create a snapshot of everything being regular, and call it default. The last confusing part is that because you can make any of the add effects at the bottom as a variable, none of the fields are natively available through code, aka you can add reverbs, etc. at the bottom of a mixer, these guys. So to do that you have to right click and actively expose a variable like the volume of a particular mix. Okay, so you right click. pretty nice. Uh, right click and actively expose a variable like the volume of a particular mixer. Expose parameters is none. Duck volume. Don't 
think that's what I wanted. Okay, we already have a default start, so we don't need a default snapshot. Maybe we do a snapshot like this for the rainy mood. You right click the triangle, I think. You can see the exposed parameters on the top right. There we go. You can right click the field in the editor. Volume of typing. So let's grab volume of music. Volume of weather and volume of typing. Uh, I just realized I'm doing all this in play mode. I hope it doesn't uh, undo when I go back to edit mode but at least I know what to do now. Um, and we've got these. So we should be able to access those in code, hopefully. So it's, it's okay to edit it all in play mode, that's nice. Slider that defends the pitch, attenuation unit. Okay, those are our effects. Send unit. So probably like sending sounds through to other effects. Um, expose for. Okay, so we probably want like uh, volume. I'm not sure yet how uh, we've got the T float val um, with probably a default value, and I assume val is the name like my exposed param, my exposed param to. Uh, probably want to rename those better. volume typing volume and music volume and then these guys I'll be able to set um, like music volume is equal to somehow we grab Our mixer dot something probably. Maybe mixer dot what do we got here? There's one remaining caveat to the audio mixer thing that is not clear. 
Audio is traditionally thought of as decibels, which is in the range of negative 80 to 20, zero. So when it comes to assigning music volume, it's exponential, not logarithmic. Okay, so I will probably make things extremely loud on accident, but that is very good to know for why. Get these uh oh we probably want to actually get well we don't need to do it per group uh, so basically volume is mathf dot log 10 of 1 times 20 or similar then you can zero to one the value of a slider to have it work correctly oh sweet okay that I was probably gonna have to Google the math. That makes that makes sense. Uh, sensing it in Discord to just T float. Get float. Remember the name. Music volume and our default. Oh, output value. Okay, cool. So we now have our initial volumes. I believe what we would want to do from here is add a way to update them from a window and then add a way to propagate them back, which I would assume is just set float. Cool. So this will give us our um, initial volumes. We'll immediately overwrite here when we start. We'll add a settings window with some sliders that can update. Uh, you know, we'll just we'll just update them directly. Uh, we actually don't want to do that because we want to propagate it through. So we'll do. Um, tricks like these. Um, do you need... I've never... okay. Yeah, single is field and range. Cool. And then same. And here we will... So do audio mixer dot set float. And we'll do the same for the others as well.
Cool, so when we create a new window in the game, we now have some public functions in our singleton manager that we can access that we can basically bind the slider in the window to a new volume that will update, I assume, the mixer volume live. And also, we probably don't need to track like what the actual volume is, but we can always remove that later. Uh, I'm gonna exit play mode and make sure all these changes I made remain the same. They do. And I guess we'll go create that window. Um, keep the rename there. I don't think I fully understand snapshots yet, but that's all right. We will default to normal values, get rid of that echo effect on typing, and let's go create a window. So we'll do that in our handy dandy debug scene. I have overrides here. A little nervous about deleting that if I didn't apply them. I'll come back to it later. Um, cool, so I think we can just copy over so contacts windows base and then we'll put settings in this. Keeping my name in the scene, making sure I settings window manager. And we will add our settings icon. While we're at it, update the title. And we'll just add some super simple sliders for now. Master volume. We've got music volume. Weather volume, typing volume, We'll style this up nice and pretty later. So this one's music. This one's weather.
So in here we want four sliders. Um, slider. Probably UI space. Master volume. in and then we'll probably have like on edit events for them hopefully that we can just call those functions from earlier and we'll figure out some logic for the master as well master slider music slider weather slider type in the slider cool so can we say master volume dot on value changed? Um, just that syntax. Dot add listener. Okay. I'm just pass a function through, so we'll do like. Uh, let's just do music at first for easy testing. Uh, on that changed. Um, what have I done? Is mechanics, that's fine. And what parameter am I missing? Slider then. Method group. Oh, dot, dot. yeah. <laughs> it is a list of cool. All righty. So we actually could have done the chore hand up there, but this is probably cleaner. Just gonna add those four listeners. We'll just do music at first, but here we'll say remote control manager dot instance dot update will set set music volume new value. And is there anything else we need to do? That should slide. And I guess we need to add the remote uh, control manager to this debug scene. Let's just grab the pre-filled one from here already. And count switcher drop down. Let's make this a little less brittle. Make sure we draw a count switcher. Let's only do that. This guy's still fine. rest of it should be fine. We should get 
Um, audio mixer is set in all three of the sources. We don't actually need to be saving it here, I think. Oh, we do. Okay. Audio mixer. We will reset all these volumes when we've got everything hooked up. We'll default them all to the defaults. Uh, let's grab that map that Jason shared. Um, so in here, we're getting a new volume that is 0 to 1. Um, but we want it to basically be either negative 80 to like 20. Yeah, where most of it should be right there. Just make sure like log 10 of 50. Oh, wait. So log 10 of 1 is 0. So at 50% volume, it would be negative 6. And then at like really low volume, negative 20, that makes sense. Really high volume, we've got... That's not quite right. One last thing to note with sliders, setting values causes refreshes and event dispatches. When setting a slider starting value, you want to call the set value without notify to set it up without having to call itself over and over. Thank you very much. I guarantee that would have been a good 5-10 minutes of hunting down, figuring out why it was just calling itself when it notified itself. Uh, when you said uh, the volume formulas, uh, log 10 of 1 times 20, uh, the, two, the two variables there, 1 and 20, um, I assume one of those is like the volume slider amount, like how, how much volume. Um, why? What is the other one? Another solution to the log value issue is the simpler lerp from negative 80 to 20 for slider amount. Oh, okay. I mean, that's kind of, that makes sense. Huh. Yeah, so zero amount is negative 80. The hundred's 20 and it slides across. That makes sense. I'll do that. The other Andrew is much more uh, math friendly. I'm still working on it. Um, so I probably want to do it in the actual, let's say here, decibel amount. So we know our units by the time it gets here. Uh, what you'll notice is the slider doesn't feel right. Uh, because it's not linear. I'd Google it because what happens is it only feels like half the slider works. First half has a dramatic effect, but the rest doesn't. ChatGPT should know the answer to this. It's a common problem. Ask it about Unity mixers, though. All right. Yeah. Um. Uh, zero to one slider in Unity. That is volume.
Oh, okay. So the 20 you gave me is basically like a... Oh, it's... I mean, it's constant because that's just the magnitude of the scale of volume we're working with. Okay. So if we take that and say we've got our slider value, which is 0 to 1, we say float decibels is equal to 20 times, uh, you want to do that, but it's like 001, so that'll give us our decibel, we could set a minimum of negative 80. Okay. So I think, I mean, it's probably fine to let people to go down to like negative 80. It's just really quiet, I guess. I don't think we need to set like minimum and maximum here. But if I was trying to control a little more the audio, maybe that would make more sense. So now we've got our decibel. Let's go up to the keys as well. Music decibels. Cool. I think let's go see if that works. Just the music slider we've set up, but Slider set up. Music volume is the correct one. Let's prefab up our settings window and I guess we're playing music from here. We can just set it here or test it here. So right, I didn't set those default values. Uh, I hope this is not really loud for the stream. I can hear the music getting quieter and louder. So I want to see the actual... So we got music here. So it goes negative 80 to zero currently. I probably want it to go all the way up to 20. It's pretty loud, but I mean, if people want it that loud, I guess they can. Uh, if you want to test it in editor, you can add an on validate. Oh, okay, that, that's, that's a cool tip. Um, Yeah, I guess I wouldn't be able to hear the music itself in the editor, but I would be able to see it updating in the mixer, which is nice. Um, cool. Well, I want, let's just say, uh, sliding air value of one results in a next volume of zero decibels, and I want 20. How would you change the formula? Add 20. I mean, and then we get negative 60 to 20. That's probably fine. But let's go ahead and do that on validate trick. That's kind of nice. Say, on validate or
Oh, I did not know that. I mean, I've seen that function around. I did not know how it actually worked. That's very handy. Now let's go ahead and not do that, but we You can put code in there to clamp, update, revalidate values based on editor changes. So for example, take the new field values and reapply them to mixes. Okay, that, that's nice. Uh, let's go ahead and let's throw all these in. Um, we also want to set these default values. Uh, we'll still hold off on the master, actually. The caveat is that it is always called even an editor not playing, so you can gate it if not with if is playing, etc. Okay. Which means if you have empty unassigned sliders and change any editor value, it would throw errors. Gotcha. So I think your if something playing got censored out, but if we say if uh, application dot is playing, gotcha. Uh, cool. So I'm going to just leave that in for now, but I want to come back to that. Weather decibels. I want to have a full mixer experience here. Uh, so we've got our three specific volumes. Um, we want to set their defaults. So music volume, typing volume, and weather volume are these floats. Music volume. What did I call those? Oh, it's in the remote control manager. Okay. And so that should set the defaults. Now I want to try this on validate. Let me just. see it in action real fast if I slide these sliders around. I assume what I want to do is grab the slider values in that on validate and apply them to the mixer with those functions. So if I go over here, grab this music guy, there we go would assume that I would see it printing more every time I change it. Let me make sure I didn't uh, goof something. Settings window manager is here. Um, anything for validation? Why did I print it twice though? What triggered that? So, media player. OK. 
Okay, when it control Z, it triggers it. If I edit the value manually, it doesn't. But then I control Z that, and it does. Well, let's see here. Should trigger on any script change, aka on play, on reload, but on any change in the script. It's not actually tied to the slider. Move a float you made. Any value on the actual script itself. Oh, I see. So here, if I uh, Should trigger every time I update that script's value, I think. Because moving the slider doesn't change the field or script data, it's not applying. Uh, right, right, right. Gotcha. So I probably want to actually. Um, okay, I see. That is nice. And this does not belong in here because what I actually want to do is when these change, I want to apply it to the mixer. So we'll drop that on validate here. And we'll say uh, if our audio mixer is not equal to null, then we will set those values. So now when we update the volumes in the script, we should see it updating in the audio mixer as well. So we go over to our remote control manager, you see these guys. Well, not quite. Um, okay, they don't have the defaults because obviously I'm not starting it. Maybe that should be in like the wake. And maybe the audio mixer is not here. No, it's not. make sure I'm triggering it properly. Uh, I just mean if there are cases you want to control fields, you can. For example, if a string value had a word or command field, you could auto strip the white space straight after the field finishes being typed. Or enforce a max value by doing a clamp on an on validate afterwards. Or updating a range or array size based on a count field updating. Yeah, that that seems very handy. I don't think it's super necessary here. I'm just trying to make sure I'm understanding how it all hooks up, just so I uh, next time want to do something like that, I can. I uh, appreciate the uh, the tips and the, the guidance here, just making sure that I soak it all up while I can, instead of just adding more and more to my to learn list later. Um, Manager. So triggering the on validate plenty of times. And I wonder if just our audio mixer isn't updating in the editor. Maybe there's some sort of like trigger refresh or something being drawn. 
updating volumes. Okay, so it should be updating these volumes. Uh, I guess it could be in like, I could print out the volumes, but I think I understand the flow here. I've never variable updated the mixer editor to time before. Yeah, it's probably something funky, either like, I mean, I could output each of these volumes and make sure that I'm getting the decibels I expect, or maybe there's like some sort of something in the audio mixer where I need to tell it to redraw or something, but I didn't know about on validate, which seems super powerful, so. It's nice to know how that flow works. Um, I'm gonna just leave this for my own notes for now. And we'll say, triggered, um, is triggered when any script changes in the editor. And that's, that's a very handy tip to know. Uh, but it did sound like the, the the music slider was indeed working, and so now we should also have weather and typing sliders working. Um, a great example of it is to actually call git component automatically when a field is nulled out or a find child to auto grab the child element like a target point. That's probably really nice. Yeah, there's been more than once that I've like. I mean, not necessarily renamed a field, or, but like something I did lost the reference and uh, in something I was working on and it takes so long to go punt down what's missing sometimes. Um, I think we did want to add 20 to each of these though, because we wanted to go from 20 to negative 60 instead of zero to negative 80. So let me add those in. And then let's think about the master volume. So logically, if you have a volume mixer, other cases I use it are for things like when I drag a text file in at editor time, it might read the text file and build the model so I don't have to do it at game time, say it's performance. So you drag a text file into some script variable and rather than that variable holding the text file itself, which would need to be read at runtime, you trigger that reading now or immediately to pull out whatever you need. So it's already ready at runtime. That makes sense. It's a text type called text asset. Unity's name for a text file, you can read .text from it. Okay, yeah, I have not seen text asset either. I've been just using the C-sharp like open file and just sticking those text files in the resources folder. Uh, did not even know a text asset existed. That's, that's nice. I'll check that out real fast, just to see where it's at. Honestly, most Unity devs haven't heard of text asset. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure I'd call myself very knowledgeable about a lot of Unity things, but nothing I've seen, I've, I've watched videos on like interacting with text files in Unity and not a single one has mentioned text asset. They're, I've always said, just like stick it in the resource folder or like encode it in some other way. Uh, let's see what we got here. It's not a UI component, it is a, um, create a text asset from a string and a script. Node asset a path. Oh, you probably do. Yeah, just in that on validate, you're probably creating it from your script. I covered in a video on my channel about how to use automation to populate arrays based on what's in the project, asset directory, using tags, etc., without having to manually fill arrays. Gotcha. That makes sense. I will I'll queue up that video for after the stream. I imagine it'd also be useful in 
Uh, there's a couple places where I have um, kind of not exactly the same thing stored in two places, but like my game manager, rather than having to go read through resources to get all of my employees, uh, I have them all just in an array on the game manager. And it would probably be nice to, whenever I update that array, it goes and triggers that validation to go pull out the employees for each category and stick them in or update those other like per department lists and per boss list and coworkers and stuff like that would nice to, would be nice to do automatically instead of having to say oh I've added this coworker I need to add them to the game managers all employees I need to add a, their contacts stuff like that um so what I use is if you click any project asset, any at all, look at the little blue tag icon in the bottom right of the inspector. Little blue tag icon. Little circle bottom right of inspector window. Background tasks, cache server, lighting. Little circle bottom right of inspector. I, I feel so blind today. Bottom right of inspector window. Asset labels. Ah, yes. The, the only thing down there with text. Uh, that's a label. You can label any asset with a, any number of labels. And you can do a probably like object I find to filter by those labels. So I can say employee. with a bundle and cool guys click the blue circle oh okay so I can just give him oh okay so then I'd be able to find all objects with like the prop label or the terrain label. Label architecture. So that's this guy. Gotcha. Those same queries also work in code. Even in the search on the project view, you can write L road to filter by them. L road. You gotta type it correctly, I guess. Okay, cool. Do you um do you use these filters a lot? I imagine they would be very helpful in like larger code bases. I've used um the t prefix a little bit for like prefabs in bigger projects but uh 90 percent of unity devs don't yeah it seems like one of those things that i can definitely see devs being like i don't need it i know where things are and, but if you do spend the like minute it takes to properly tag stuff it's probably much nicer shaves off seconds every time you look for anything from then on and there's probably also some like uh, bigger benefits in more conditional cases when you're finding stuff in code. Um, let me, yeah, I mean, he can keep the tags, I guess. We'll, we'll keep him an architecture boy. And I'm just gonna clear up, clean up some of the stuff I got. 
Okay. Filter by that. And I guess B is like a bundle. Interesting. Okay. Well, let's look at um, volume mixer. So I can already tell this is going to be a question for ChatGPT. But basically, we have our uh, volume sliders for music, weather, and typing. We don't want those to just be set to whatever the master is. We want to keep the individual like ratios together. So when we compute the decibels for each of these sliders, we basically want to be incorporating the master volume slider in as well. So let's just ask. Similar things with assets, pre and post processors, auto tag and label based on what subfolder they are dropped into. Do things like auto generate scriptable objects or write C sharp enums based on the contents of directories, lots of stuff. Yeah, that seems that seems very nice. I think there's been a lot of things that I've wanted to just like basically like list out all the stuff in this directory. But it's it's an awkward thing to do if you don't know where that code should live. Like obviously you don't want to be reading the directory and listing it out at playtime. But in the editor, like I mean, I ask myself like, where are you gonna do this? You're not gonna just stick it in like a script uh, unless you're uh, using something like. Uh, some of those editor functions, I guess, like on on validate to trigger uh, this sort of logic. Um, I think this is something that I will uh, aggressively push my my co-founder to also do with me because I think it'll seems like something that. Uh, it's very nice to do from the start and uh, keep things cleaned up. And yeah, being able to like, if I create a new employee in a directory or like pop in a new audio, well, maybe not an audio file, like a new uh, desktop background, it'd be nice to have some sort of triggers of like, oh, okay, add that to the, the settings for all these employees to have it as an option. Um, probably lots and lots of stuff you can do. Try the control K window. Everything's hidden away. What is this? This is too fancy, one might say. Huh. Okay, okay. Yeah, list view, detail view, grid view. Huh. So. If I want, like, all my prefab windows, file browser window. That's nice. If I want, uh,. Nice scriptable object, employee. I guess I probably want to tag each of those employees and not rely on them being, don't know why actually it matches employee on some of these. 
probably just from filtering other stuff out. Oh, because they're Corporal Employee class type. You can also hit the save icon in the top right to save a search. So, save. Not sure what the difference between saving a user and saving. Oh, okay. They're probably renaming this to like employees. Oh, that's going to be so nice, actually. <laughs> um, one of my favorite things to do in like 3D projects is to just like go collect tons and tons of assets and then spend way too long like doing level design and building out the world. But I'm always just drowned out in prefabs, um, just all those options. So it would be real nice to build like these sort of saved search filters and be able to find things a lot nicer than scrolling through a list or a grid. Control K for this. Okay, cool. And you say user is on your machine, project is part of the project, so I'd probably check that into version control. User works cross Unity project. Oh, so I could use this search in other projects. Interesting. It also supports some Boolean logic, not tags, etc. So if I say uh, road, let's see here. What do I want? Type prefab, but not window. So all of my prefabs that aren't uh, like syntax is a bit funky though. You might have to look it up to get fancier. Yeah, I'll look up a bunch of the syntax. This looks super cool, though. I like, I like being able to reuse it across projects, which is interesting. I'll have to think about how I want to use that because it seems like it would probably be really specific to like the structure of each project. But obviously, you can store all those in the project itself, and probably have a few for your user. That's really cool, though. Uh, the most useful, in my opinion, is the detail view. Do a search for something there and add columns. That's the most awesome part. Let's see. Prefab, let's switch to detail view, list view. Um, add columns. Oh, probably table view, actually. Add column. Oh, yeah. On the labels. Oh, we already have that. ID. Yeah, that's really nice. And I assume it defaults back to whatever view you had with the right columns. That's cool. There's a set of columns, tables, sorry, so you could expose all professions across all employees or modify all colors in one place. Yeah, what if I were employee, add column, corpo employee, job title. Add column. Can I edit them from here? Um, 
Probably not. Uh, but that would be very nice to be able to edit the values. I just added the department enum, so rather than clicking through each one, yeah, but I can do that too. So we got username. We should be able to, I've edited colors and stuff there before. So, know the department is in this group no why doa is read only well, i have these uh job titles here which are also just um uh, text which i'm just now realizing this person's job title is absolutely wrong uh, the department is an enum that i've created but i feel like the text one should work this person is uh sales Person. Mm, yeah, it's nice also to be able to see, uh, I mean, sorting is nice, see the inconsistency in uh, the titles that I've chosen. Mm. Update her to salesman. Customize columns, image columns, reset tables, export, modify table data using the experimental format. When you change the data, search is not aware of any dependencies. To change the column to experimental, right click on the column header area and select column format experimental. Choose either a serialized or material property. So if I Format experimental serialized property. Cool. That is that is very nice. <laughs> it does sound pretty Unity. Usually, I feel like they start in experimental and just never becomes experiment or never becomes real. But uh, this is this is pretty nice. I'll do the same. Column format experimental serialized property. So I can very easily say sales, accounting, accounting, accounting. I've mostly just done the accounting department, I guess. Uh, and sales. That's that's super nice. Actually, I'm gonna be using this all the time. This is very cool feature. Uh, you know what? I'll just uh, stick them over there. So I've got them. Um, let's get a bigger window, actually. Uh, so we did have an answer ready from ChatGPT, master volume, ranges from zero to one. So we multiply the two volumes together and I think our minimum and maximum are already handled by adding 20 to get up to our maximum. So we just multiply the two values together. Um, 
There's a third party plugin to Unity called Odin Inspector, which is that level of cool helper and functions put across all of Unity. Things like allowing you to modify scriptable object values inline from any inspector without having to navigate to it first. Odin Validator is even more powerful, lets you write automation tools. I actually looked at Odin Inspector a little bit. Um, I haven't bought it yet, but it does look very, very cool. If I, I was mostly looking at the attributes that it adds, but there's so much to it. I feel like it does sound like something that uh, I'll absolutely get for making cooler uh, tooling just for Andrew and I. Yeah, I think if I just showed him this GIF, he'd be like, all right, we need that immediately. <laughs> Let me check out Odin Validator. I haven't seen that one yet. So is it kind of like the like a supercharged on validate function that looks through your scene and looks for like problems? every time you change something in your scene. Nice. Yeah, this will be really nice too. How much is this? Yeah, Odin is something I've been putting off uh, looking at it just because it feels like a rabbit hole I'm gonna fall down and just make cool editor windows instead of anything uh, more visible. Um, imagine a rule where nobody could have an empty profession. It could validate and give you editor rules and you could write a fix button and you can have an auto run. Other examples are auto grounding floating walls etc. Fixing mix missing materials and shaders. Yeah, grounding like floating walls and stuff would be very nice to do in the editor. I always just leave things slightly above the ground because it's so hard getting it perfectly without using the physics engine that every time I load into a 3D scene, everything just falls half an inch. But having something that uh, does that and just sets it properly would be real nice. Fixes missing materials and shaders too. Yeah, that'd be very nice. Uh, a lot of times when I'm using random, like especially free assets, but I, I could use a little more help in uh, detecting and fixing potential problems there. That's cool. I'll check that out. I use the hold V to go to snap vertex mode and you can snap to the top of a surface when you drag. Huh. I think I somewhere in my brain I remember seeing or hearing about that like when I was first learning Unity and I think I completely forgot about it and just assumed it never existed. Like it makes sense now. You can just snap to stuff. It's one of those things where I was like, oh, yep, that's not a feature. Guess it's got to be hard. That's that's a great tip. And after this demo, I'm probably going to get back to more uh, something more 3D. So good timing. <laughs> um, so master volume changed. Update master volume. When the master volume changes, we're going to call all the other uh, volume updates. Unity are masters of hiding features. I feel like Unity kind of has the Jira problem of like, not only is there a feature for everything that you need to go like hunt down and dig through to find and then like look up documentation for how to use. But it feels like in Unity and Jira, 
there's like three different features for everything. And whichever one you find and figure out how to make work is the one that you just use from then on. And you just don't know the other ones exist. I don't know if you agree with that, but it does feel like... I think I... I don't know if it was somebody last week or somebody I was talking to this week. They just did a talk somewhere on like... I don't, I don't think it was you. Somebody did a talk on like the buttons that are just front and center that people never use in Unity. Just like, did you know this button existed? Um, I watched a ton of videos this week, and I, I feel like <laughs> there's a small chance this is something you did. Um, but I feel like somebody else was just talking about this talk that they did, and it just seems like there's so much that... I just need to like dig into a playthrough and just like build up that tool belt and be like, oh, okay, here's the problem. I know the Unity way to fix it. Um, but it would be nice if things were a little easier to learn <laughs> or like find, not necessarily learn, like discover and find and like figure out a little more intuitive. A lot of it is just daunting. I was using Unity for two years and was afraid to use scriptable objects. Coroutines also were scary for a long time. Yeah, I'm finally starting to wrap my head around coroutines. Like, I know, or I knew how they worked in principle, but just like, I mean, I came from C++ and Ruby, where they each have their own, like, threading issues or, like, global interpreter locks like very people are very scared about thread safety in ruby and rails and so i saw coroutines and i was like how does this actually like work work under the hood uh, i know it like does stuff in the background but setting up like the enumerators and yielding properly and passing control between threads and resuming all that was very very daunting i'd say I'm slowly getting more comfortable with them, but scriptable objects, I watched a Bracky's video when I was making a card game, and I was like, these things are amazing, and I don't think I've done a project since where I have not used them in some way. Um, they, they're pretty great. That's the thing about routines. There are frame partitioning. There's actually no threading, threading in coroutines at all. Yeah, that's, that's so weird, because... I mean, you see with your eyes, like if you don't do a coroutine and you do like a like a web request or something or like lerp from one color to another, you see like it, your main thread basically hangs. And so you're like, oh, okay, logically I use a coroutine to spawn another thread to do that in the background. But wrapping my head around like, oh, no, it's actually just like every frame it goes and asks if that coroutine is ready to start executing again or like if it if something's done and then it jumps back to this code over here and jumps over to this coroutine like that's the weird thing for me that's it's not as much daunting as it is just like spooky like if if i find a bug in a coroutine like how do i even trace the path that it took to get here topic that you start to really internalize later is frame time, aka it's like a speed run. How much time do I have left this frame to run through my all my stuff before I hang? So later you start to look at the time you have, aka frame rate per second divided, and you start to ensure work never takes longer than a frame to avoid stutters. Yeah, luckily I haven't gotten into projects where that has been an issue yet, but I do have some experience with, uh, I used to do a lot of like uh, AI gaming competitions where it wasn't making the game, it was building AI clients for games in like tournament format. And there it's, it's very, very 
heavily ingrained from the start. It's like you have 60 milliseconds per frame, but a lot of your like A star pathfinding and stuff is going to take longer than eight, uh, 60 milliseconds. So you like measure the time as you're uh, working through it and like come back to it on frames where you have time left after executing actions. It's very funky as well. That's the benefit of a profile. It shows you the time count of all functions so you can visibly see what is taking so long. So a routine is literally just giving x milliseconds of work and handing it to the next frame. Yeah, that's... So Unity does, like, some sort of magic in there of this frame has 20 milliseconds left and we can only fit this one coroutine left in that frame and then we resume the next coroutine or does it actually just like if you have multiple coroutines that bump you over the um the limit that's when you start to hang does it just try and do all the coroutines every frame So I think this is the proper logic for the master volume. When we update any of the individuals, we want to incorporate the master sliders value into the decibel formula. But when we update the master, then we want to just trigger the other three using the new master value. is set on the slider. Don't need to actually set it anywhere. game running at 60 frames per second has 60 frames in a second, so that means you have 1 60th total time to run all logic before a hang. Unity will try to redraw the frame each tick. If the work overruns, you will delay the draw and you get freezes. Okay, so yeah, Unity just tries to run everything. It doesn't try and do anything smart, like uh, whatever that programming challenges, filling the bag of different times. I guess that makes the most sense. It's probably the most efficient to just leave that efficiency up. Oh, okay. It does do that for physics. Yeah, but physics they do, I mean, it's a lot more of a contained system. Like they know a constant 0.2 default tick rate. Interesting.
yeah, I guess they have a lot more uh, like predictability in the physics engine and its performance compared to like random coroutines written by people like me. So it makes sense that they can really optimize that physics uh, system into like a predictable tick rate that they can rely on instead of doing any of the same like oh this coroutine will take this long let's do it this frame and this coroutine can wait to the next frame that's why if you ever use physics calls in update you are liable to have unreliable physics physics goes in a fixed update call but if you try to catch input in fixed update for example you will miss inputs because the rate is slower i feel like that is a bug that everyone starts with when you build like uh your first platformer and every video is like oh yeah make sure you put your your gravity logic in or your movement logic in fixed update so you can get that physics uh gravity falling whatever and then somebody's like well i want to also add a button to jump and they just shove it right in the same function and then they're like why doesn't my space bar work most of the time it only works some of the time i I remember that problem. I, I think I was coding on a plane once and I didn't have internet and I was building a like like the old Lemmings game. Uh, little guys fall from the top, go over, but you could press space and have them jump over obstacles and so like some could go this way and some bump into walls and go back, blah blah blah. And I was still first getting started and I was like, why the heck does my space bar work? Like a fifth of the time and I didn't have internet to look it up and this whole flight I was just like what is going on I'm going crazy and did not even when I got back I was like ah fixed update doesn't run as often so it's not picking up those inputs but that was that was a, a stupid bug that I'm still salty about because I didn't have the internet to look it up I would love to toggle some volume sliders and hear the beautiful sounds of code working on the first try. I had a similar lost week of my life with trigger enter. I felt counterintuitive that you need a damn rigid body for triggers. Yeah, I feel like also when I first started, uh, I got like UI and game objects confused with like trigger enter I guess trigger enters for game objects and I was trying to use it in the UI and I could have sworn that it worked before I just added like a rigid body with no gravity or like a box collider or something but I think you have to use the event system for like mouse mouse in now or something like that and I was so convinced that it worked beforehand I was like this is dumb why why do I suddenly have to change? Music. Gets real loud. Master down. It's looking pretty good. They default to the wrong things, but that's alright. Weather. That's some cozy mood right there. I like that. Perfect. There is an interface. I pointer enter, I pointer stay. You slap it on anything, it will show your mouse events. So use it to create custom draggables, etc. Or toggles or world clickable doors. Oh, okay, so it's the same logic between, I mean, you can use it the same in UI or game logic. It would be nice if, I mean, it's not the greatest to use completely different, like, interfaces for the same sort of, like, is your mouse entering? I kind of understand why, but I'll, I'll, I feel like I might have used, like, eye pointer enter, actually. Or, like, a... Uh, Something for dragging. That's not me. 
click about that uh, dock option in a minute. Either it's the high point or enter hand there. Yeah, for just highlighting stuff as I'm hovering over it. And showing tooltips, I guess. But yeah, it's, it's nice to... I mean, that kind of goes back to, like, Unity has bazillion ways to do the same thing, but if you choose the wrong one, it's way more work to figure out how to get it working. Also, a physics raycaster lets you raycast into the world and interact with the world space canvases. Treats it like a mouse at the end of the raycast. Oh, so, wait, if you raycast at an object with a eye pointer enter interface defined, it'll trigger that because the raycast is treated like a pointer? That sounds like I wouldn't expect it to be intentional, but a very magical feature if it is. Huh. You can probably do some really weird stuff with that. Common thing in VR games, various hand pointers, watches, world screens, etc. Huh. Now I have a VR headset downstairs and I have never even attempted making a game for it. Maybe if I get a new one. Mine's getting a little old. That's be fun. I mostly just paint in it. You can kind of see the the raycast working like that. Um, one thing that I noticed on this is that the defaults do not seem to be coming through. We've got our default volume set in the remote control manager. Let me take a quick look at how things are looking. So master volume is set, but the other three are not. Settings window manager. I wonder if the master calling the others is an issue. Out of the box, it's easy. Plug in a VR headset and it just works. The camera starts moving with the headset. More advanced features require the native libraries, but they have out of the box grab, throw, teleport, etc. If you go with the meta stuff, it includes APIs. For out of That's cool. Yeah, I have a Vive, or not a Vive. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess it is a Vive. Uh, the original like HTC Vive and I've been eyeing the new Quest 3 because everyone seems to love it so maybe I'll grab that. I didn't expect the like um, head tracking from the camera to just work out of the box or I assume like the controllers probably work out of the box with some of the libraries so that's that's cool. You've been doing VR gaming for 10 years. I've been nine months on a Q3 project. Oh, nice, nice. Um, do, is, is like the game public? Can I check it out or is it unreleased? I've had a lot of ideas for VR games over the years, but none of them, uh, I've been drawn to like go out of my way to figure out the setup for been a do I'm a very big like uh, strategy guy and very familiar with keyboard and mouse but it'd be interesting to try more VR stuff. Your studio name got uh, censored out. 
but creature.page. Let me check that out. Game is unreleased. You know, this looks like a good vibe to me. Mixed reality game sounds super cool. I mean, I know you can't share details, but I mean, a game called Creature that is mixed reality immediately makes me uh, hope that it's the uh, maybe not necessarily like Pokemon esque, but um, something that really draws on like exploring and seeing new creatures and uh, maybe doing stuff with them. That sounds like something I'll I'll watch. I like the, uh, the pixel avatars. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, I saw some of the games uh, published so far. Or maybe I didn't. Partner Studios, at least. I see. Huh. I mean, that's really cool. I was a little disappointed at how few VR games there were. I mean, back when I got my Vive. I know there's a lot more now, but... Uh, Always good to have more, so excited to see new ones come out. I'll check out creature.page uh, when it releases, or uh, whatever the the game is called. Uh, that'd be cool. DK1, that's the the original like Oculus dev kit, right? Yeah, I don't think I was out of school yet, but I really wanted, I was out of school, but that would be good times, I would imagine. You learned Unity to develop for it. So yeah, you really VR first, kind of. That's cool. Would you recommend the new MetaQuest 3? Or, I mean, obviously there's, there's a new Steam one that's supposed to be coming out, which is probably like the higher end, or like Meta the Quest Pro or whatever is on the higher end. Um, obviously there's the cheap versus big boy ones, but on the cheap side, is the Quest 3 a good one, you think? After doing contracting and doing work for it, I quit my job and went Unity full time. It's a step up in all ways. It's hard to know what's going to be the best. I can't vouch for the overall value of props yet, but I do know Meta are throwing a lot of resources behind it. It's one of the three big things they're hinging the whole company on. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'll grab it. It's 
It's a. Uh, I hope that they are successful. I hope the other companies are also successful. So that seems like a good one. My brother just got one, so I'll check out his. But I'll probably grab that and check out more games. It's been at least a few years since I've set mine up. I'm a big, uh, I mean, the most vanilla game now is Beat Saber, but you can't not play it. I got Beat Saber and I got DDR set up, so all my exercise is covered. Right, right. Setting up my uh, on value change listeners before setting the values. Probably triggering those listeners when I do not want to. It's pretty awesome. Can't go wrong with musical lightsabers. Yeah, I really liked the. Uh, there was like a space shooter musical game at one point that I really wanted to get, where you also had like whips or something, or I wanted to get into. Um, but Beat Saber really just won out at the end. Audio Shield, yeah, I played uh, Audio Shield a little bit with the two colored shields. It was really nice. Um, there's some shooters that I was also into. Let me take a yeah. I didn't play too much Audio Shield. I played it a lot on my brothers. I was really big into like, uh, oh, what's the painting one? Tilt Brush. I did a lot of Tilt Brush, almost like 50 hours in Tilt Brush. And there was a sculpting one that I didn't have in Steam that I did a lot in. Box VR was really good too. Could only play it for like 30 minutes at a time because it's so intense. Just like working out wise. Brookhaven experiment was really fun. It was kind of what I used to introduce everyone to the headset. Catch and release. Great vibes. Great vibes. I bought Half Life Alex after. Um, like disconnecting my VR headset when I moved. I haven't played it yet. I really want to. I did not realize that I owned it, so maybe I will go give that a shot. In Death, if you haven't played, is also really good. It's like a little dungeon crawler. Um, it's very like ranged combat focused. It's a roguelike with pretty good graphics. Um, also pretty like exercise intense, but I liked it a lot. My wife really liked Job Simulator too. Yeah, I'll have to get back into it. It's a whole genre of games that is just like one headset away.
funny. Like most things, once you start doing something for work, you never have time or interested in it socially. All my go-to game references, I now realize, are like five years old. Yeah, it's it's also something that's moved so fast. Like, I feel like if you take even a six-month break, I mean, you have a couple of the core games, but everything uh, seems to be getting better and evolving. I mean, it's kind of got that AI problem. Right, I'm gonna go throw a few hours into the new Spider-Man and head to bed. Good luck with the devs. Thanks again for uh, joining. Uh, you always have so much to teach, and I really appreciate all the tips and the good chats as well. Uh, enjoy the new Spider-Man. Uh, have a good one. Thank you. So something still clobbering my default values on the audio mixer. Damn it. 
to set the call values in here. Volume. I mean, I guess they are slightly off. Um, I see a couple of you are still in here watching. Um, I am going to just grab the head of the bathroom real fast. Um, please do not judge me. I will be right back. Alrighty. Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, we're gonna figure out what is clobbering all these default volumes, and that will be the last bug that we fix today. Uh, as you can see, all these are getting set to zero, even though we can hear weather, typing, music, I think what's happening is the decibels are zero and uh, we need to reconvert those back uh, zero to one instead of negative 60 to 20 to set the proper values on the sliders. Master volumes 0.75 because we don't have a master volume exposed, I imagine. Let's check our audio mixer, expose parameters, we do not. This guy, how did we expose that again? Um, Select an audio mixer group, right click one of its properties in the inspector. That's it. Expose that, and we want it to be called master volume. And so these are in decibels. So let's go ahead and uh, update those units so we don't run into the type of problem we are currently running into. So 
And now, when we have these guys, we want decibels. And that explains why our sliders are zero instead of what we expect. But let's also settings window manager. Make sure we don't need to update anything in here. No, we do not. Okay, so the weather volume is a float from zero to a hundred or zero to one, which is the value of our slider, but we're reading in a decibel amount. So what we want to do is say, if we had that master volume, then we normalize it over uh, zero to one. And if we don't, we set our default. So here we want master volume is equal to like, we could um, do like a lerp and do a mathf.normalize maybe. Uh, Lerp of like zero to one master volume. That should say like if it's, I guess master volume is uh, negative 20, or it's negative 60 to 20. So that's not quite right. This looks like a job for chat GPT. Great. Now how can I convert decibels from negative 60 to 20 to a slider friendly value that's 0 to 1? Uh, I know that that is the formula. Does Unity have a normalize function? That does that, or it's like it's not clamping. Normalize value. Um, you know that's probably a nice one to have in case we want to add another stuff. We might as well. that and we will normalize master volume from negative 60 to 20 and we will do the same for each of the volumes. So this one's music volume This one's typing volume. And weather volume. Cool, that should, that should work. So if we are getting a value then we, that value is in decibels, and we are normalizing it between zero and one for our min and max volume in decimals. If we don't get a value, we just want it to be 75% of our decibel range. Let's give it a shot. They are all 75%, which is fine. If we just barely tweak this, do we hear a noticeable difference in music? No. What about weather? I think this is correct.
This is not correct. We still hear music. This has no effect. So what did we break? Oh, we're not even using these, which... Right. That would explain a lot there. Don't think that'll actually fix what we just saw as a bug, but maybe it will. Let's give it a shot. Can we hear music, weather, and typing? And if we bump music down to the nothing. Exposed name does not exist. Oh, it's because we renamed our exposed names. But where are we using the old ones? Music volume. Decibels. Let me double check that that is correct. And we'll do it for the other ones as well. Master volume decibels, music volume decibels, okay. Decibels. And I'm just now realizing we didn't need to do the math that we did here, because we could have just set the master volume decibels directly, which does this for us. So, we're going to actually just rely on the audio mixer to do that. And because everything is a child of our master group here, if we min if we lower the master decibels, everything else will be quieter by default. We don't need to actually pull in this master value here. So, and we also don't even need to update these based on master changes. So we will do the exact same thing, set master decibels instead, which we need to add. Decibel is a word that it's already hard to spell the first time you spell it, but the more times you type it, the weirder and weirder it gets. We want master volume decibels. So that now will update this guy directly instead of updating each of these to be lower, which is what we want. Um, we can take out our debug here. We set our initial values before setting the triggers on when they change, which updates the mixer. Um, we are reading the decibel values out, normalizing them over the range of possible values for the slider value, uh, otherwise just defaulting. I think this looks good. Everything should work here. Okay, so if I kill the music, no music. If I increase the master, we get more weather and typing. And we should be able to see these updating in the mixer. So this is this is wrong here. The 
scaling on the master volume very off. Almost completely down is where we want about the midpoint to be. It's actually wrong on all of them. Well, maybe not because this gives us a lot more granularity around the middle. I'm sorry to the stream that this is loud. <laughs> Setting the decibels, we add 20 to the decibels because we don't want it to go down to negative 80. We want it to span negative 60 to 20. I don't think that this will work, but I am curious. Uh, why do my volume sliders sound so bad? They're so loud at the lowest volumes, even. I feel like it's something to do with the scaling. You're using the logarithm base 10 function to convert the slider values to decibels, which is a common way to handle volume control as our ears perceive a sound on a logarithmic scale. However, the addition of this, is, which is just so we don't take a log of zero, and the subsequent addition of 20 to the result are likely skewing the decibel values. First, make sure that the range of the slider is set to a value that makes sense for your application. Slider value of one should be maximum. That seems correct. Once you have the slider range set up correctly, you can even use the following formula to convert the slider value to decibels. This will give you a decibel value of negative infinity when it's zero, which I don't think we want. That's why we have this. And a decibel value of zero when the slider value is maximum. But we want a decibel value of 20 when it's maximum, which is why we add 20 to this, and also why we add that. You can scale and offset the slider value before taking the logarithm, like so. Where scale and offset are values that you choose based on the desired decibel range for your application. So should the 20 be on the inside? Say. Excuse me. With this, the decibels will range from negative eighty to zero. Uh, actually, negative infinity to zero. I want my range to be negative 60 to 20. Uh, that is why I add to go from negative infinity, infinity to zero and plus 20 to add 20 to the min and max values. Is that not correct?
let's... Oh, I didn't send it. <laughs> Whoopsies. Okay, man. It will linearly interpolate. But sound is logarithmic. Shouldn't I logarithmically interpolate between negative 60 and 20? That's some funky math right there. I don't know about that. And I guess we can uh, see. Just see how it sounds. Just give it a shot on all of them. Why not? Okay, so minor adjustment should not change much. This does not work at all. Oh, right, because we're not uh, using the decibels. Let's give this one more shot. where we actually call the function that uses the decibels we compute. Yeah, it's still not, like, logarithmic at all. So, let's go back to what we had, and what we can do is just change. Um, we can just make it, like, negative 20 to 20 or something like that if we want. Just lower the range, because we'll be in a even range. Um, or, you know what, we can we can always come back to this another day. We can work on more fun stuff. We'll add our window as an application to this game. Uh, we'll wrap up with that. Um, but here we've got at least somewhat working volume controls. The only downside is, like, the medium volume is like a fourth of the way through, so it's not perfectly centered. Like maybe halfway up is good enough or loud, so you can go extremely loud if you want, but there's a lot of, uh, I guess, granularity in the volume that you can choose. So let's just, I'm gonna double check that it still works, reverting all our changes there. We will make sure that the volume gets properly set. Turn off weather, it's gone. Turn up typing, it's beautiful. Turn down the music, bring in some weather. Yeah, so... It's good enough for now. You can at least turn stuff off. We'll add like mute and like other on off buttons, stuff like that uh, off screen. More of the more boring stuff, we'll style it, etc. But let's go ahead and wrap up our settings window changes. Let's go back to our exciting scene. Um, remote desktop viewer. 
And let's hook up another application in our app drawer. Which we might need to make taller pretty soon. So, people tool. Don't know why it has overrides. What are these changes? Direct transform hover tooltip is. Oh, it's just because I copied. Um, let's see. What do we want to do here? We want our app drawer object. Bring that guy in to our app list. Um, okay. We will just do the same. So here we have settings. And we will give it a settings icon. We will call it settings. And we will link our settings window to open when you click it. Easy peas, lemon squeeze. So it's a little concerning that, I mean, these have no, no overrides, yet if I bring in another copy of that um, prefab, the app drawer object, it's not, the tooltip is in the wrong spot. Is it just because I need to toggle the vertical layout group? to rebuild the layout? No. I don't necessarily want to just like move it. I guess I could, but why are these ones working is the problem or the question. So, I copied these over from existing ones, it's just a template. So I'm going to undo those, I'll bring in the clean objects and set them up properly. Oh, the icon is because app list is probably a prefab, isn't it? Or app drawer, I guess. App drawer, yeah. I see. So let's bring our uh, people tool back and we'll just apply those changes when we made sure this is the right icon settings the right icon we'll apply the overrides to the app drawer cool so we'll close that and we'll just do a final run through the game make sure everything's still working properly um, and then we'll call it call it done for this week on stream um, if you missed the beginning of the stream, my name is Andrew. I work at a studio called Chroma Golem. We focus on AI in games and interesting uh, ways to use AI, uh, emergent mechanics, um, working it into like the dev tooling process, um, generative AI in games. This is one tech demo we're working on that uses a lot of text generation to uh, 
basically create an entire company's worth of employees. Each employee gets entire file systems created for them. Those file systems get files created for them. You also have conversations generated between coworkers uh, for every pairing in this company. And you can also converse with those coworkers on your own. So more runtime generations that respond to what you say based on the chat history, your relationship with that person, your role in the company, etc. Uh, it's a very big tech demo on just like large amounts of uh, generation. Uh, we did in fact forget to set our new audio mixer, which we will set real fast. And the other things are already set. So I will I'll go ahead and re reinitialize everything with that. Oh, I probably actually didn't set properly if I set it while in play mode. Let me just double check that. But as I was saying, uh, this is a big tech demo that follows up from a game jam game that we built last month where you basically play a little beat 'em up little retro brawler on the street and then police show up and you have to converse with them and convince them you're innocent. Uh, so this basically takes that to a whole new level of now you're entirely uh, within a company, you have tons of people to talk to and you can also jump around and take over the computers of other people. So you're talking to people as other people as well. So it's a much thicker mesh of uh, conversations that you're dealing with. And there's all this background information that's both generated and pulled into the prompts for a context. So, control K scenes. We want mo desktop view. Just learned about Control K. It's pretty nice. Pretty nice. Let's go make sure that our audio mixer is properly set here, where it is not. Let's head on back to our start screen, and let's give it one last play. Um, today I did just put out a uh, article on Medium. Uh, going over some of our learnings that we figured out while working on this demo specifically. Um, basically just some tips and suggestions on when to use GPT 3.5, when to use GPT 4. So if you are doing generative AI or like generating text in your games, I highly recommend heading over to uh, medium.com slash chromagolem. It's our only article up so far, but it's got a bunch of tips on uh, if you're doing this, use GPT-4. If you're using this, use GPT-3. If you want this, use GPT-3 with a higher temperature, and so on. Uh, so should be pretty helpful, I hope. Um, I can put a link. Uh, there is a link to it in our Discord, so if you want to check out the description of this video, check out our social links down there. If you jump over to the Discord, you can uh, check out that article as well. Uh, here we are on Alice's computer. We have our applications. We have the new people tool we built, which shows us and other employees. Uh, you can kind of see that Alice only has contact with these coworkers here, Bob and Carol, because she doesn't have relationships with anyone else. Um, and you'll also see that in obviously her chat window where those are the only people she talks to. You can pull them up, you can talk to them. Um, these default chat histories are new every time you play. Um, you can say whatever you want. Your goal is basically to uh, convince them to run a virus.exe file. So you might say, 
I'm sending over that file now. I mean, this probably won't work. It might because she's the easiest uh, one to manipulate in the game. You just simply drag over that virus file and uh, it did not work. She, we would get an audio cue if she ran it, but um, you know, when you've run the file, thanks. But we have at least put the file on her system by sending it over, and now uh, we just need to convince her to run it. And that's like the core gameplay, it's very conversational. Hey, just got off the phone with her boss is Bob. And he told me to tell you to run that file ASAP. He needs the reports it generates. So we're basically, there's that audio cue if you could hear the thunder in the background. It's somewhat subtle, mostly for testing. Um, but that kicks off a bunch of generation, which you can kind of see in this uh, little debug log for us in the editor now. But it's generating her file system, it's generating her contacts, it's generating her existing conversations with those contacts. Um, and when, when that's all done, we'll get a little pop-up up here saying, hey, this person ran your application that you sent them. Uh, they've been infected, you can now control their computer. So we can now hop over to Alice or hop over to Carol's computer, and she's got a whole new set of contacts. We can see Alice is already infected. She's in red, but uh, we now have a second person that we could talk to Bob from. He's the more difficult one of Alice's two contacts to um, convince to run your virus uh, because Alice is just his intern but Carol is his assistant, Carol has a little more sway in convincing him to run a random file. So it's up to you as a player, like, do you want to take the hard challenge and go straight from Alice to Bob immediately? Um, have a little, a little harder time, like, convincing him, hey, this is totally safe, don't worry. Or do you want to take an easier route, maybe infect Carol, who's the easiest to infect, and then jump over to Carol's computer and talk to Bob from there? Um, and once you've infected Bob, he's going to have his own contacts. You can kind of work your way up this corporation. Um, there's, a, there's a network of employees that we're still building out. But uh, alternatively, once you're on Carol, she has a little office romance for David, who works over in sales. And if you are interested in like exploring the sales department more, you could pretty easily infect David and tease your jump over to um, see more like salesperson computers, see the the boss salespeople, m work your way up the ranks over there as well. So if we were to say like, hey David, I wanted to send you this earlier, but I was stuck in meetings, lol. You should run it and tell me what you think. We send him the virus file. Um, he will obviously crash because we can't write good code. Uh, but we can see that there is generation in progress for David. So he did run it. Right, he doesn't have a boss. So uh, we haven't built his boss yet. So this crashed, which is fine, because we're just doing this for demonstration purposes. We heard the audio cue of this guy got infected. It's generating his file system. We'll see if it actually works because uh, of that crash. Uh, we got a little console window. We've got the file system generated, but we're still working on chat history as we've done three of four. Um, so that might hang because I think I think what happened there is David does have a boss, but one of his contacts, the fourth contact that we're generating the history with, when we're putting that contact's boss's name in the prompt as context, it crashed. So 
that person doesn't have a context or doesn't have a chat history, so that's a bug to fix. It's all right. Um, but we did want to test these new uh, applications that we built today. We've got the people tool, so you can scroll through and see uh, the employees. We now have Carol and Alice infected, so as you infect more and more people, you'll kind of get this like checklist of who you have, who you don't, whose computers are still like something to target. Um, I'll also add a like org chart that uh, more visually shows the connections. Like Alice works for Bob, Carol works for Bob, Bob's boss is Ethan, and so on. So if you wanted, if you're scrolling through and you're like, "Ooh, Fred looks like somebody I want." to steal something from his computer on, you'd be able to say like, oh, well, Fred, um, to get to Fred, we might need to go to one of his employees. Ethan is one of his employees. To get to Ethan, we need to go through Bob, who is his employee. <laughs> hey, Josh, I was uh, just wrapping up, uh, just kind of showing off some of the stuff that we built today. But uh, things are looking good. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this game at all that we've been working on. I just built some audio stuff that uh, will probably be extremely simple for you. It's literally just volume sliders for different tracks in a mixer. But uh, it works, so that's exciting. Um, you can uh, adjust things, and I... I think I still need to do like a, like a logarithmic scaling of the decimals. It's very linear right now, but uh, you can create the vibe that you want. Get all that typing, all that weather sounds. Uh, and you can see, uh, where's my audio mixer? These are, uh, basically controlling the decibel settings for each uh, track that we're playing audio through, which is kind of cool. Uh, Jason was in here earlier helping me figure out how to work all the audio stuff. But it's nice to see that works. I still need to style it. Um, this still needs to be built out with the org chart, but uh, the core gameplay is there. We need to build out a little achievement system. So, for example, achievements for like infect all of the accounting department, or like go from the intern to the CEO in just 10 infections, or like this guy wants to move into an analyst role. So, maybe we hack into his computer and we convince his boss, Fred, to switch them over to another department, maybe in like data analysts or something. Um, maybe that's an achievement, who knows. Carol um, wants to have an office relationship with Carol, so convincing them to go on a date or something, I don't know. It's a lot, it's very open-ended right now. I think we want to build in a bunch of fun achievements that you can try and do, so you can play however you want, but it's looking cool. You can switch from computer to computer. We're back on Alice's computer. Go check out her chats. We can uh, check out her files. You can see uh, personal goals, maybe personal thoughts. Maybe we want to check out her thoughts on Bob do not read file, which when you try and open it, it generates it in the background based on her personality, her role, her boss context um, and once it's generated we can also like send it over to Bob and see what he says about it. Uh, I haven't actually played Papers Please but I've seen people play it, I've watched people play it and I think that is probably a good comparison of like what I'm shooting for. Uh, one thing that I want to lean more into is giving each person like uh, I mean, personal goals, professional goals, whatever you want to call it, something that they want. And as you're like browsing through their file system, 
you kind of learn more about like whether they're a good person or a bad person. And so maybe there will be achievements for like if Bob really wants a raise, but you think he's a terrible person, maybe there's an achievement for getting Bob fired instead. And like there's also an achievement for uh, getting him that raise. So you kind of pick and choose which route you want to go based on what you think. But here we go, we got Alice's thoughts on Bob. Bob is Bob, he's my boss, he's alright. You know, this isn't as bad as I thought it would be. Um, coffee is left half finished on my desk, it's gross, it's cold. Worst day ever, don't read this Bob. So I think we want to um, send that over to Bob. And he says... I'll make sure I communicate more effectively. As for the coffee mugs, I apologize if it's caused any inconvenience. I'll make sure to clean up after myself. And you can also see the like friendliness between Alice and Bob updates with each message. So it'll be really cool. Uh, I'll send you, uh, or I guess down wherever this window is. Um, it's up on itch.io if you wanted to play it, Josh. Um, it's pretty simple, pretty quick playthrough. Just, uh, there's a link in the Discord. Oh boy, that's loud. Uh, there's a link in the Discord. You can try it out. I'm still building more. I think maybe I'll maybe I'll play some papers, please, and get some ideas of like what it does well, what it doesn't, and. Uh, there's probably you're probably right that it probably would have a lot of overlap in the audience. But I'm just wrapping up the stream now. Wanted to make sure that everything worked. It looks like everything we built today does work. So uh, I don't know why I'm just uh, closing all the applications as if it's a real operating system. Um, yeah, well, uh, thanks everyone for joining me today. Um, the link to the Discord is in the description. We uh, would love to have you if you want to just chat some more. I stream every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, I usually don't go quite this long, but you know, if there's people hanging out and chatting, I don't mind. It's always fun. Uh, we got through a good amount of stuff for this week. Let's see, we. Got our settings window done, we got those bugs fixed, we got the people tool done, and uh, yeah, maybe next week we'll tackle that uh, achievement system and get some like win conditions and lose conditions going. So yeah, thanks for, thanks for tuning in. I will see you guys next week.